So thank you very much to everyone for your patience. <laughs> we will start again um, now. So, uh, Simone, you're recording, great, thank you. So welcome and thank you everyone for joining to the first year and reconnect webinar on relapsing polychondritis. A special thanks to Professor Arnaud for his avail availability in this very difficult moment. It is really appreciated. And from the chat, we can see a lot of appreciation also from many participants already. Today, Professor Arnaud will discuss with us the novelties about the diagnosis and the therapeutic management of relapsing polychondritis. And Professor Arnaud is full professor of rheumatology at the Department of Rheumatology of the University Hospitals of Strasbourg. And since 2017, he is also the ear and Reconnet Senior Disease Coordinator for relapsing polychondritis. As usual, the webinar will be uh, recorded. And please, um, Professor Arno, if you go to the next uh, slide, the next one again, sorry. Um, as usual, the webinar will be recorded and it will be published on the ER and Reconnect YouTube channel and on the ER and Reconnect website. You should be able to see the links um, in the slide. Um, if you want to be updated on the upcoming webinars, you can subscribe to our newsletter at the link shown in the slide. If you want any to raise any questions during the webinar, please use the question and answer session or the chat if you wish. And Professor Arnaud will be available to answer your questions after the presentation. Um, after watching the webinar, we would really appreciate if you could participate to a webinar satisfaction survey at the link shown in the slide so that we can improve our webinars in the future. Thank you again. And please, Professor Arnaud, um, you can start. Thank you so much once again. Uh, thank you, my, my pleasure. I apologize for the, the connection problems. I think we have a, a very slow connection here, uh, but I, I will start again. Uh, and by a clinical case, uh, we are going to follow a 63-year-old uh, year old man. As you can see, he is not confined, he is in the bus. And the reason why he is in the bus is that he is actually going to the emergency room because he has a painful left ear uh, for three days. When you look at the ear, clearly there's some inflammation. And actually what we can say is that there is an inflammation of the cartilaginous part of the ear and that the lobule is not touched, is not inflammatory. And this is the very typical appearance of a chondritis. So in this a very rare disease, relapsing polychondritis, around 90% of the patients will have an involvement of the ear. 65% uh, an involvement of the nose and one third to 50% of the patients an involvement of the respiratory tract. As I just said, this is a very rare disease. We do not have very precise data uh, because uh, we can only um, make statistics on diagnosed polychondritis and it is very clear that there are some cases which are not diagnosed, but the prevalence is around 10 per million, and the incidence in the UK is less than one case per million per year. So it's super, super rare. Something to remember is that the typical age of onset is middle age adults, around 50 year olds. So it's not a disease that happens, such as systemic lupus in, in young women. And the sex ratio is one to one. You have as many men can see as that female. So the patient is actually going to the emergency room and based on uh, discussion with many, many patients, I can tell you it's always the same. They will see 10 different physicians and nobody will have a clue about what this is. So, um, well, what, what could it be? What could be this inflammatory ear? It's always the same. When you know the disease, it's easy to recognize. But when you have never heard about relapsing polychondritis, it's more difficult. So we doctors are super good at inventing incredible diagnoses. And the two diagnoses that most patients will receive is first infections and insect bite. Uh, infection is very, very, very common uh, a diagnosis which is proposed by the medical teams. And in my experience, almost all patients will be put on a combination of antibiotics and corticosteroids 
because you never know. This is very, very common. Uh, but actually, the infection of the ear is not so common. Uh, you need an entry point here. I think it's very clear there's, there's a piercing. Uh, otherwise, you can have some kind of a herpes or zoster of the ear. Occasionally, you can have some cases with erysipelia, but then it's not just the ear. It goes on the face. It's very easy to distinguish. Another diagnosis which I have, uh, have heard many, many of often very commonly is insect bite. Oh, you must have been bitten uh, by uh, an insect, a spider during your sleep. Uh, honestly, what, what's the probability of that happening? Uh, but by preparing this talk, I, I have found this uh, case uh, which was posted online by a mother thinking that the kid could have um, a bug bite. Uh, uh, and this is a gentle reminder that I, I told you the typical age is 50 year old, but any patient can have relapsing polychondritis. It can start very early. This is a French series of 10 pediatric cases, and you can see the age at onset 1.8 uh, years, 3 years, 4 years, 17 years. Uh, so it, it can be starting even very young. Of course, there are some other differential diagnoses we should be aware of. Uh, one is frostbite or sunburned. You can have a sunburned on the ear. The main difference is that you can see the lobule is not spared. It is also red, also inflammatory. And I always have someone in the assistance telling me, oh, but I've seen a case of T lymphoma of the ear. That's an important differential diagnosis. Well, actually, I, I don't think it is. When you look at this ear uh, with its skin lymphoma, it is very clear that this is not achondritis. I uh, can think of a diagnosis which is very tricky. It's called Winkler's disease. It's small nodules of the helix, which, which can be very, very painful. It mostly happens in men around 50 to 70 year olds. And usually either you remove the lobe, you remove the, the nodule by cryotherapy or you, you make a little surgery, the diagnosis can be made just by the inspection. It does not look like a chondritis. So finally, we have an inflammation of the cartilaginous part of the ear that spares the lobules. And you have three very clear examples of typical chondritis in three relapsing uh, polychondritis patients. Very often when you see the patient, um, there is no current chondritis. So it has to be a retrospective diagnosis. And of course, you should ask for pictures, for photograph. Uh, when you seriously had a ear being swollen, uh, painful for several days, usually the patients make photographs. It has to be red, it has to be swollen, it has to spare the lobule, Usually it's very painful. The patients remember it very clearly. They cannot sleep. And it has to have a minimum duration of at least a few days. It cannot be 10 minutes. This is not a chondritis if it lasts 10 minutes. A very common differential diagnosis is just red ears. Uh, when someone is a bit hot, well, the ears are, are there to, to do uh, the role of a radiator, like a thermal dissipator. So you see this patient, it's just normal red ears. The lobule is red. This is not a chondritis. This is just being a bit hot. So then there's a more tricky question. Uh, when we talk about chondritis, we talk about relapsing polychondritis. But of course, there are other diseases in which we may see chondritis. The most important differential diagnosis is GPA, granulomatosis with polyangiitis. I just want, you to, I just want to give you a very important message. It is written at the bottom of this slide. You do not have positive anchor or renal involvement in relapsing polychondritis. If you have a case of relapsing polychondritis and renal involvement, then it's not relapsing polychondritis. This is JPA. There are other diseases in which we can see chondritis, uh, systemic lupus, sarcoidosis, Crohn's disease, IgG4, uh, some cases of a Kimura disease. Uh, this is very, very, very rare. And it could be fortuitous association 
or an overlap. I, I, I'll come back to that later. The reason why we are a bit uh, careful about uh, these episodes of chondritis is that in about 10% of cases, it will lead to deformities. Um, we, we know, and this is something we teach to junior rheumatologists, you always have to look at the ears and inside the nose when you are confronted to a case of polyarthritis and you have no diagnosis. Uh, I'm going to show you typical examples. You have the typical rabbit ear. The, the consistency of the ear is soft. The helix is moving with the patient. This is not a normal ear. Uh, you can have, on the contrary, a very hard ear with a calcification of the cartilage, this is called porcelain ear. And you can have a typical example, I'm sure you've heard of, which is cauliflower ear. The ear remains very puffy and the normal structures like the helix, the anthelix are a bit destroyed. This of course can be seen uh, with patients doing sports with ear trauma, uh, people working in prisons, rugby players, boxers, uh, so you definitely ask, ask to, to ask the patient about their, their leisure activity, not to conclude to relapsing polychondritis while this is just a person playing rugby. Then let's move on to the nose. Um, as I, I said, it is involved in about 65% uh, of cases. And I'm going to show you a very typical chondritis of the nose. Be prepared. It's coming. There it is, there is absolutely nothing to see. In a huge majority of cases, nasal chondritis, there is nothing to see. It is just pain at the root of the nose, at the junction between the nasal bone and the nasal cartilage. When I am seeing a patient for the first time, I'm asking about pain in the, ear, in the nose, but I never say that the pain should be at the root of the nose. I just ask the patient, where is the pain? And if the patient showed the tip of the nose, usually it's not the proper diagnosis. The pain is really at the junction between the nasal bone and the nasal cartilage, very high, very high in, in the nose. Occasionally, you can still have some inflammatory signs. Uh, this is medicine, so everything can be a bit different sometimes. Uh, you see this patient, uh, that has a, both a inflammation of the root of the nose, I think spread and puffy, but also a scleritis at the same time. So this is a very typical uh, kind of deformation you can observe in relapsing polychondritis, saddle nose deformity in around 50% of cases. Uh, as you, you can see, this is shared with uh, uh, GPA, granulomatosis with polyangiitis. This kind of deformation can be seen in both diseases. So there's a, a huge list of uh, differential diagnoses. This is a very good paper in Revue Médicale Suisse. Uh, I can uh, send you the, the reference. I think it's very interesting. You have all the cause and all the mimickers of saddle nose deformity. Uh, that's a great, great paper I, I recommend. Then uh, something I, I don't like because that's a lot of problem for the patients. It's the involvement of the respiratory tract which can be seen in around 30 to 50% of patients. Uh, you can have different types of signs depending on where the inflammation is located. When it is in the upper part of the respiratory tract, you will have episode of di dysphonia. For several weeks, the patient will have no voice at all. You can have anterior cervical pain, like a kind of uh, inflammatory th thyroiditis, some kind of stridor if it's inspiratory. And then you can have an involvement of the lower part of the respiratory tract with cough um, due to tracheitis, thoracic pain, and what I really fear is respiratory failure, because of course that's very, very difficult to manage. I'll talk about that later. A sign that we can um, occasionally see, but it's not very common, is that the, the junction between the sternal bone and the, the ribs can be either swollen, like Tietz syndrome, or, or on the contrary, you can have some kind of pulse, some kinds of depression. So it's very, very important to inspect the thorax to see if there is a deformation. Then I've been talking about relapsing polychondritis and chondritis because it's the emblematic manifestations. But of course, this is a systemic disease. And so many, many different types of organs can be involved. I'm going to breathe, 
through these different types of manifestations. But I'd like to say that the disease starts by chondritis in around 60% of cases. So if you know that chondritis should make you think of relapsing polychondritis, the diagnosis is not too difficult. The true problem is that when it starts by something else, uh, rheumatologic manifestations, eye inflammation, or, or, or just general problems, uh, then it's difficult to make the diagnosis until you have a chondritis that appears. So articular manifestations are common. They are seen in about three quarters of the patients. It's a common presenting feature. Usually it's arthritis or inflammatory pain that is migrating, asymmetrical. Something important is that you have no erosion, no distraction. It is not nodular. And usually you see nothing when you perform the radiographs. If you see something, it is an overlap with something else, rheumatoid arthritis or a spondyloarthritis. I'll talk about the, these overlaps in, in a few minutes. It, it is actually quite common. Another point of entry is ocular manifestations. Typical manifestation are episcleritis and scleritis. Uh, you always have the risk of scleromalacia and occasionally perforating scleromalacia. So it is really recommended to show the patient to a, a eye specialist. All the parts of the ear can be um, attacked by the disease. So you can have transmission deafness if you have like a cauliflower ear, but it can also be the inner ear with acute cases of vertigo, tinnitus, acute deafness. And I have several patients that need some um, tools like cochlear implants to, to hear properly. And occasionally you can have some cases of relapsing seromucous otitis due to the uh, station um, thing, uh, dysfunction. Cardiovascular manifestations are not very common, but they are very typical in men. The sex ratio is really, really in favor of men. While I mentioned earlier that the disease strikes as much uh, in women than in men. You can have many, many, many different things. Uh, I'm going to breathe through. Uh, you can have some kind of aneurysm, some kind of aortitis. Just look at the thickening of this aorta. You can have thickening of the root of the aorta. And here you have a bilateral stenosis of the coronary arteries. You can have myocarditis here with a late, late contrast enhancement on the MRI and you can have some kind of valvular involvement. And when you cut these valves, you have a very severe inflammation inside the valve. And it gives some reversible uh, conduction blocks. Uh, if you compare the two EKJ before um, the first one and the second one, we have just been giving just a few corticosteroids to the patients uh, and the blocks have been reversed. Then something to know is dermatologic manifestations. Um, because there's a bad association with myelodysplasia. Typically, these manifestations occur in men with an age of onset of more than 60 year old, uh, and they will have at the same time um, an underlying hematological disease, which is not of good prognosis, myelodysplasia, and dermatologic manifestations. And these dermatologic manifestations it can be oral ulcers, like aphtosis, but also, and this is something to know, small nodules of the limbs. And if you find them, it is usually a sign of active disease, looking a bit like erythema nodosum, but not quite the same. Very rare manifestations. CNS involvement, I have barely seen this. And as I mentioned, and I want to say this again, if you have kidney involvement, then it is not relapsing polychondritis. So how do we make the diagnosis? Well, first I mentioned good clinical history, good clinical examination, and very often it has to be retrospective because when you see the patient, there is no current inflammatory manifestation. Something typical for the ear chondritis is that it is very, very sensitive to corticosteroids. The patient is given corticosteroids and Two days later, it's almost completely cured. So if you find this, this is a good sign that it is ear chondritis. Obviously, an infection does not improve well and rapidly under corticosteroids treatment. 
you can help yourself uh, with um, these MICHE criteria. Uh, these are not diagnosis criteria, but I, I think it's a nice list uh, just to have in mind what is important with major criteria, which are chondritis, and minor criteria, which uh, summarize what we have just said, ocular inflammation, involvement of the inner ear, hypoacusia, vestibular syndrome, and articular manifestation. Then there's a big role for imaging. This is something very, very important. And this is my uh, practical recommendation. I usually do a CT scan of the face, especially the sinus. It's a good way to be sure that there is no GPA. Of the neck, this is what I call cervical. Uh, we will have a look at the cartilage of the neck in just a few seconds and of the thorax because you, you will see it helps for the differential diagnosis. Usually I do baseline echocardiography to be sure there's no involvement of the heart valves. I do a spirometry and there is a little trick here. You ask, you have to ask for inspiratory volumes as well as expiratory volumes. If you ask nothing, they will only do expiratory volumes. But in this context, you have to ask for inspiratory volumes. And then the usual document, documentation, uh, typical things you would do in case of a inflammatory disease, uh, x-rays, and so on. So this is why I do the uh, CT scan of the thorax. I, I said that the main differential diagnosis is GPA. Well, these lesions. Uh, for sure are not relapsing polychondritis. This is GPA. So this is a very good way to, to help for the differential diagnosis. And another reason why I perform CT scan of, of the chest, but also of the neck, is that you can have the, the cartilage, which is like bitten. And this is a sign, a retrospective sign, in favor of relapsing polychondritis. You have a normal uh, thyroid cartilage on the left. You can see it's very smooth. And on the right, you can see that there are some kind of parts which are missing, like it had been bitten by something. This is an indirect clue towards the diagnosis. I think the, the most interesting thing with the CT scan of the chest is to have a look at the trachea. This is very, very typical. Uh, the cartilaginous part of the trachea, the anterior part is thickened and calcified. And the posterior part, which is membranous, is usually spared normal, at least at the beginning. This is very typical. And you can look at the reconstruction. This is clearly not a normal trachea. Something interesting, because you can have very localized uh, stenosis, is to ask the radiologist to perform inspiratory and expiratory CT scan of the chest, because you can see if there is an inspiratory collapses of the airways. And this is very important because you should not perform bronchial fibroscopy if you have a suspicion of relapsing polychondritis. This is one of my most important message. The, the trachea does not have a normal structure. There are dozens of cases published of patients with relapsing polychondritis. Someone not very careful performs a fibroscopy and then it's a catastrophe with a lung perforation. So no bronchial fibroscopy, please, if you think of relapsing polychondritis. Perform inspiratory and expiratory CT scan. This is very typical. I mentioned these inspiratory and expiratory volumes when you perform uh, the spirometry. Normally, inspiratory volumes are higher, more important than expiratory volumes. When it's the contrary, it's the sign of a tracheal obstruction. To be honest, I, I do not perform PET scans out of um, a research setting because it is currently not very clear how it will change the man management of these patients. Some cases with infectious uh, tracheitis will also have FDJ uptake, so I don't think this is very relevant if it is not within a protocol. So I, I do not do that uh, routinely for, for my uh, RP patients. I can give you a few examples. Uh, you see here published, there's, there's an inflammation in, in the nose and then later it's cured, but, but still you do not need a PET scan for that. 
Let's talk about a biological inflammation and a simple marker CRP. Uh, this is very tricky because this is obviously a very inflammatory disease, but occasionally and actually quite frequently CRP can be normal. So in about one third of the flares, you have a typical ear chondritis and strictly normal CRP. So this is good to know. Uh, it can still be relapsing polychondritis. Then the antibodies, I have already given you my most important message, no anchor, no renal involvement in relapsing polychondritis. If you find this, then this is not relapsing polychondritis. This is probably a JPA. What about these uh, specific antibodies? Well, I never do them. I, I don't think this is very useful. Um, two have been uh, reported in the literature, anti-type 2 collagen antibodies, but it's found in 33% of the patients. So flipping a coin in the air performs better. And it's the same for the other antibody, anti-matrilin one. You find it in 30% of the patients. So this is clearly research. There is no practical use for that. And it's also quite difficult to obtain. I don't know of any really good validated lab for that. Then a question I have quite often is what about cartilage biopsy, especially cartilage biopsy in the ear if you have a doubt? Well, I don't recommend it for a very, re very easy reason. It is not specific. You will find inflammation, and I have reviewed dozens of biopsy. There is nothing very typical, so it doesn't really help. There is one biopsy that I perform occasionally. It's the nasal uh, mucosa biopsy. If you have a doubt with a localized form of uh, anchor-associated vasculitis, uh, then uh, I, I perform a nasal mucosa biopsy. But I do not perform the cartilage biopsy uh, when I have a suspicion of relapsing polychondritis. This is what you see, inflammation starting in the perichondrium. This is not specific to the diagnosis. Of course, if you think of a T lymphoma, uh, this is a picture I've shown early. Uh, well, you can perform a biopsy, but as you can see, the whole ear is here red. This is not a chondritis for sure. So you've made a diagnosis of relapsing polychondritis. Well, you should not stop here because in 20% of cases, there is another inflammatory diagnosis which is associated. Usually it's rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus, Sjogren's syndrome, or Hashimoto's thyroiditis. In 20% of cases, you can have hemoptysis, especially myelodysplasia. But for sure, you have to perform a few a full autoimmune check to be sure that you do not have a second underlying disease. This is why I do the, the radiographs of the hands and of the feet. I want to be sure I don't have erosion that would be an overlap with rheumatoid arthritis. What's the prognosis? What's the course of the disease? Well, unfortunately, uh, there is no cure for relapsing polychondritis. I, I'm sure you know that but this is a very long lasting disease with flares and remission. And the patient can flare up very late in life, even though they have been in remission for a long time. I have several examples of relapsing polychondritis starting around 50 year old, just a few crises. Then the patient was asymptomatic for 20 years and at 70 year old, 75 year olds, it starts again. So I usually say um, relapsing polychondritis one day is relapsing polychondritis forever. Unfortunately, uh, this is not a very, very nice disease. Only a minority of patients have a very benign course. Most of them will have some kind of relapsing disease which will uh, impair the quality of life in, in a significant manner. So that is not good. Uh, my friends from Paris, Nathalie Costedoat, they have performed some kind of clustering studies to identify phenotypes of patients. And I think it overlaps very well with what I have just told you. If you have just chondritis, minor chondritic involvement, just the ear, just the nose, well, this is really painful. This is really a problem, but the patients will not die from this. On the contrary, if you have an involvement of the respiratory tract, this is more severe, and I think we understand clearly why, if you have an acute respiratory uh, 
um, problems, then it is obviously not good. And then there is a third phenotype, which is the association with the underlying myelodysplasia. So this is especially the men starting the disease after 60 or 50 year old. Uh, usually they have uh, skin manifestations. This is not good uh, because the myelodysplasia is often very re refractory and these patients will need iterative transfusions and unfortunately will need a lot of care. What's really interesting is that a study has just been published on the same theme. This is the, the group of uh, Peter Grayson, Marcella Ferrada at the NIH in, in the US. Um, they have performed the same kind of approach, a factor analysis, cluster analysis, and they show three different uh, clusters uh, with very different patterns. This is just published and I really suggest you to look at this paper, it's really interesting. So what about the treatment? We know that this is a quite a refractory disease. We know that we will need to treat. So as always, the therapeutic pressure depends on the type of manifestations. When it's the first episode of a, a, a just painful chondritis, in a way, I, I try to control the situation with an infusion of prednisone or just short-term prednisone. I give 40 milligrams, 40 milligrams, 20 milligrams, 20 milligrams, 10, 10, 5, 5, stop. And usually it's okay. Or just NSAIDs. Uh, when it's the first episode, we have some practical and efficient way to control it quite well. Where the problem really starts is that quite often, as I said, it, it comes back, it comes again. And then we will have to, to start some kind of DMARS to prevent the relapsing effect. And well, you can try different things. Um, Dapsone, which is used in many parts of the world, but it is quite difficult to use. So depending on your experience, you can try it or not. We don't have a good level of evidence for that. You can try colchicine. Often I do that because we have a good experience of, of, of the drug as rheumatologist. We know it works quite okay and it's not too toxic, especially if you have myelodysplasia. So I, I usually start small doses and I, I see what happens. When it's not enough, I usually have to start something else and I start metotrexate. There is no contraindication. Just as a reminder, these patients may have some kind of hematological involvement. So when I start immunosuppressive agent, it is quite often that I check the, the bone marrow, I do a myelogram, uh, just to be, to be sure that there is no underlying hematological disease. When it's more severe, uh, when the patient is hospitalized with a severe organ involvement, well, uh, we don't really have the choice, and I think it's the same in many inflammation, uh, inflammatory diseases, we use high doses of prednisone or infusions of methylprednisolone in combination with immunosuppressive agents, cyclophosphamide, biotherapies, biologics. What I can tell you is that in, in the context of, of a very severe ret respiratory problem, if you are called in the intensive care unit because a patient has very severe um, respiratory failure, to, to be honest, I have tried tocilizumab in several occasions. I'm going to talk more about that next slide, but it never worked. The only thing I know that is really able to save the patient if it's a catastrophe, a case of relapsing polychondritis, is cyclophosphamide IV. That's the, the only experience I have to really save the patient who, who really have a, a severe respiratory involvement. So what about the biologics? Well, you know how it is. Many people have tried biologics, uh, but we do not have good trials. So with uh, Guillaume Moulis, uh, my friend from uh, Toulouse, we, we collected uh, all the cases in France. We have 41 patients, and this is 105 lines of biologics. What I can tell you is that the biologic, which has been the, the most prescribed are TNF-alpha blockers. Uh, this is quite expected. It, it works in about 65% of cases. Then there's a good experience with tocilizumab, uh, but unfortunately, if you look at this slide, you have some kind of response in around 60% of cases, but this is not a long lasting response. Uh, one year later or six months later, on only a minority of the patients are still controlled by these two treatments. So we, we definitely need to find some other things in the future.
Just a word about uh, these uh, recommendations. Uh, this is uh, a webinar which is organized by the uh, European uh, Reference Network, uh, Reconnect, uh, with the help of the whole uh, Reconnect team, uh, Martin Mosca. And as you are probably aware of that, we've been working hard on many um, rare diseases to, to derive some evidence, some recommendations. You can find the recommendations we have published for relapsing polychondritis uh, in uh, RMD Open. This is a special um, guide to help you in case you are a bit stuck. Just a few words about a few treatments. Uh, some patients will keep a inspiratory collapses of the airway. Uh, you can put some kind of plastic tubes, silicon tracheal prosthesis. Uh, this works very well, but it has some limited indication. You really need a good, good experience center that is used uh, for that. In case of deafness, I have several patients that have really benefited from cochlear implantation. It really helps them. So if it's very, very severe, that's a good, good option. And then, of course, some patients uh, are asking about rhinoplasty uh, because there's a, a, a nose uh, aesthetic problem. And uh, I, I'm always a bit you know, concerned about that because it, it works for sure. Uh, you can correct the nose. But you know that this is a, a graft uh, from a cartilage, usually from the ribs. And so it means that during a later episode uh, of uh, inflammation, you, you can lose the benefit, but nothing more than that. So it can be tried. If the patient wants to try it, I would recommend trying this during a period uh, of remission, obviously not during active disease. Then uh, we have to follow the, the patient. Um, and so with um, my, my team, but also many groups worldwide, worldwide we, we have derived some practical scores, numerical scores to, to follow the patients. One is called the Relapsing Polychondritis Disease Activity Index, RPDI. And we are currently revising the score with the help of the uh, NIH. This is a great collaborative work. And uh, also a damage index called the RPDAM. Uh, many of you have participated. This is the way it looks like. It brings you some points in a way, and you can follow uh, prospectively that the patients are controlled and then the score is going down. This was the LP die. This is the LP dumb. You can follow the accrual of damage with time. Uh, this is still a bit of research, but I think it, it's a good way to follow the patients. We are now reaching my last slides, the main take, take home points, the conclusions. Uh, this is obviously a rare disease, but it is clearly an underdiagnosed disease. Not many physicians are aware of it, and I am sure that there are more cases that we actually know. The, the typical manifestation is chondritis, uh, which is a presenting manifestation in 60% of cases. But there are some systemic manifestations, and they are seen occasionally at the beginning of the disease, and in that case, you will be able to make a diagnosis of relapsing polychondritis only if you have chondritis that appear. The diagnosis is mostly clinical. Honestly, when I see the patient for the first time, I, I try to, to block a one hour consultation because I have a lot of questions. Uh, we really have to go back to the history of the patients. I always perform the detailed imaging I told you about, especially a CT scan of the face, of the neck, and of the chest. This is very, very useful to find some evidence retrospectively. Uh, the, the antibodies, uh, anti-cartilage antibodies, I don't do them. I, I think it, it doesn't work. It does not bring anything. Um, regarding the prognosis, it's a long-standing disease. It will flare and remit in a huge majority of the patients. And as always, the therapeutic pressure has to be changed depending on the manifestations. It can be short courses of corticosteroids, NSAIDs, uh, if it's just one episode of two episodes. But when it's relapsing, you have to start some DMARs, and I usually start metotrexate if there is no underlying hematological disease. And then when it's refractory or severe, well, you can um, do infusions of corticosteroids and add biologics or immunosuppressive agents. And to really save a patient in the intensive care unit, my experience is that only cyclophosphamide really works. And uh, if you're interested in following uh, these patients, you have a few patients you, you need to follow and track in time. Uh, I, I usually recommend the LPDI and EPIDAM to, to follow disease activity and damage.
Uh, if you are interested, uh, you can participate to this uh, study we're doing online. This is a questionnaire. We are interested in knowing how you manage these uh, patients, especially if you do not follow many patients. It's really useful for us to know what you do. And with this, I would like to say thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to Reconnect for organizing this uh, webinar in a um, difficult context. Uh, thank you to the uh, 60 participants uh, which are online. Thank you very much for being here. And now I think we have some, some time to, to take some, some questions. Yes, thank you, Professor Arnaud. That was really, really nice. Uh, we have some questions, or if you want, I can read them for you. Yes. So the first question is from uh, Vitor, mm -hmm. and he would like to know uh, what about hydroxychloroquine for relapsing polychondritis? So if I was trying to be funny, I'd say, well, first, you, you will have to find some hydroxychloroquine because, you know, there's a, a worldwide mm -hmm. shortage of this uh, drug, which is uh, taken for COVID while we have no proof that it works. Uh, to answer your question in a very straightforward manner. You can try. I have tried it, but usually it does not work. I think it's an excellent uh, treatment for systemic lupus. All systemic lupus patients receive hydroxychloroquine, but in relapsing polychondritis, it does not work very well. You can give it a try. You can try colchicine, and then if it does not work uh, to prevent the relapse, well, you have to start something else, and I usually start metotrexate. Thank you. We have another question also from Vitor. Is PET CT scan usually normal in between relapses? So the answer is yes. Uh, you know that the, the principle of PET scan is to, to uptake FDG uh, during inflammation. So during uh, the, in between the relapse, uh, during the remission phase, usually it is normal. Thank you. So I'm going to move to the chat. We have also some questions here. So we have one question from, sorry if I pronounce it incorrectly, from Sabarinat. Renal man manifestations in relapsing polychondritis in association with SLE. So, so, can you say this again? The association with SLE? Yes. Okay, so this is an interesting question. Uh, occasionally, we see cases of uh, patients who have systemic lupus, absolutely defined systemic lupus, and they also have chondritis, especially of the ears. This is not very common, but it happens sometimes. And then it's difficult to decide whether it is an overlap between the two disease or whether it is chondritis as part of systemic lupus. I would say it doesn't really change anything for me because I, I treat this patient as systemic lupus patients and usually it is able to control the chondritis. Apart from these chondritis, there is no other very specific manifestation. Thank you. We have another question about the um, RP dye. Oh, re renal manifestations are included in R RP dye, though uncommon. Why? Yes, um, so um, this is a very, very good question. Uh, actually, when you derive a, a score, you have to, to do a group of experts uh, and, a, and a call to these experts and they vote. Here we use the Delphi method. And at that time, that was almost uh, 10 years ago, a majority of the experts voted for including renal manifestations. I personally did not wish that, uh, but this is what happens. And so we respected the, the vote of the experts. I think we are now almost 10 years later and with more knowledge on vasculitis, relapsing polychondritis, it is very clear that renal manifestation should not be included in the RPDI anymore. And as I mentioned this, the NIH is actually revising this score. We are participating to this. This is a beautiful collaboration. And we are really thinking about removing uh, renal manifestations from the revised version of the RP dye. Great, thank you. Um, the last question from Sabina. Uh, rituximab not much efficient in uh, relapsing polychondritis compared to other connective tissue diseases. Um, are there any reasons for this? 
Yes, um, it doesn't work very, very well. You, you can see in this uh, publication that you have a good response, uh, but it is not a long-standing response. Uh, and to be honest, we have our own experience and it doesn't work very, very well. Well, we do not really understand the pathogenesis of relapsing polychondritis. Uh, I think when you perform rituximab, in many cases, you are trying to deplete the cells that produce the bad autoantibodies. And we know that this is not really the way relapsing polychondritis work. It's not really a problem of autoantibodies. There are some autoantibodies, but they may not be pathogenic. They just could be there as a marker of the disease. So in a way, it is quite logical that rituximab would not work so well. Great, thank you. We have other two questions. Would you be available to answer both or would you like to? Sure, answer? no problem, my pleasure. Great, so we have another question. If you were directing funds to relapsing polygondriate research, which areas should be prior prioritized? So that's a very, very good and difficult question. I think the association of hematological problems, myelodysplasia, and relapsing polychondritis is really, really striking, stri striking. And I think by learning more about why hematological disease appear in relapsing polychondritis, we could be able to understand better why the disease appear. There must be a connection here, and I think it's really worth checking this. Thank you, that's a good suggestion also for future research. Uh, the last question would be, what about the etiopathogenesis of relapsing polychondritis? So that's a great question. Uh, we know there's some kind of uh, autoinflammation and autoimmunity. Already mentioned that you can find some autoantibodies in the patients, but it's difficult to decide whether they are pathogenic or they are just a marker of a cartilage problem. What I can tell you is that, uh, I didn't say it before, but most patients share the same HLA alleles. Most of them are HLA BRD4. Um, so there's actually an underlying background, genetic background. And uh, we can think that there's some kind of antigen presentation, maybe shared antigen presentation from an, an unknown source that may trigger inflammation in the cartilage. Uh, there is a lot of research about that. Uh, some patients, some studies are, have shown that some cases could maybe appear after piercing of the ear, such as it would expose some antigens that would be kind of hidden in the ear. Uh, but to be honest, we, we don't know uh, very well uh, about the pathogenesis of relapsing polychondritis. There are some murine models, some mice, they, they have spontaneous uh, relapsing polychondritis that may help to understand this better in the future. But today, there are more questions than answers regarding the pathogenesis of the disease. Great, thank you. We have uh, one of the participants who would like to um, ask uh, the questions live. It's uh, Arthur. Um, Arthur, I see that you have uh, raised your hand. Um, would, you, would you like to, to ask your question? Arthur, are you still are you still there? I don't think he can hear us. Okay. Anyway, um, um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Arno. Um, if we receive uh, any other question, we will forward them to you, so that we will uh, we can post the answers after the recording, if it's okay for you. And I would like to thank you very much once again. Um, we will share the link of the recordings so that you can watch the webinar also in the future. And thank you very much to everyone for joining. We will see you in the next year and reconnect webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation. Thank you to reconnect. I think this is really great to organize that kind of uh, webinars during a, a time where we are all confined. Thank you. Um, Professor Arno, we have a message in the chat from Carlos saying that thanks in the name of all patients.
patients with relapsing polychondritis. And thanks to everyone in the chat. That's a nice message, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you a lot. So maybe we can uh, discuss to have a webinar dedicated for patients in the future. That would be amazing. We will do that. So thank you again. We will thank close you. the bye webinar bye. now. Bye.